Okay guys, so this lecture is going to be an introduction to what's known as the Diels-Alder reaction. Now Diels-Alder reactions utilize conjugated systems, specifically they utilize conjugated dienes and a dienophile. So we will take a look at multiple examples, but this lecture is really going to focus on understanding the diene and the dienophile and the requirements that go into that in order to create a good Diels-Alder reaction. So let's go ahead and get started with this. The first thing you want to realize as you're working with a Diels-Alder are the two reagents that are required. And so as I mentioned, you're going to have a diene, and we will show that right here. We're going to use, in a lot of the beginning examples, we're going to use 1,3-butadiene, which is this simple conjugated diene down here. But we start with a diene. And then we also are going to utilize what's known as a dienophile. So dienophile, if you look at the root word, just means a lover of a diene. So dienophile is what we also need. Now, this mechanism is what's known as a concerted mechanism. So it happens all in one step, similar to a substitution reaction in SN2. So in order for this to occur, what happens is the pi electrons from the diene reach out to the dienophile. The dienophile will take electrons and send it back to the diene, and then this final set of pi electrons will come down here. Now this is a very useful reaction because what it allows us to do is take non-cyclic components and create, out the other end, a cyclic product. And so we end up, in this particular case, with cyclohexene. Now we can get a lot of different variety depending on if we put substituents on the diene or the dienophile. And we'll, again, like I said, we'll look at more examples of that coming up. So these are the basic components. It's a one-step mechanism. Uh, you can reverse the arrow flow here. So it's perfectly legitimate uh, to show the arrows going clockwise instead of counterclockwise. Uh, just out of habit, this is what I normally do. I actually had students that uh, asked me that in class the other day. They had a lot of good questions on uh, dienes and dienophiles. They were keeping me on my feet. All right, so once we have a general understanding of the mechanism, we want to understand the individual reagents because it turns out the way that this is written is a very sluggish or slow reaction. It's not optimized for the best possible results when you're working with a Diels-Alder reaction. So let's talk about the specifics required for each thing. So it turns out that the diene, the main constraint here is that we need the diene to be in what's called the S-cis conformation. Now S stands for single bond. That's what the S stands for. So when we talk about S cis, look at the way I drew the diene. If the diene has the double bonds and those double bonds are cis to one another around the single bond, right? So if I take a look, my single bond has free rotation. If it's in this current setup, this would be S cis because the diene is cis around the single bond. Now, I could also have S trans, and this is a grouping that will not work when I have S trans. So in the case of S trans, I would be looking at something like this, right? And this would be where the double bonds are trans to one another around the single bond. Now, when I have 1,3-butadiene, because I have a single bond in the middle of that molecule, I do have some degree of free rotation to work with. So the S-trans can sort of isomerize and go back and forth between the S-cis and the S-trans, all right, when you're rapidly moving back and forth between those. But it is the S-cis that is optimal, and that is a requirement. Now, the reason for that is that like with most conjugated systems, we need p-orbital alignment in order for decent reactions to occur. So when I take a look at the dienophile, right, and it's got its pi bond, it has p-orbitals here. These p-orbitals are going to need to align with these p orbitals here for this reaction to take place. Now some students get confused because we're showing this on essentially a two-dimensional canvas or the whiteboard. But the way that this occurs is you have your diene and then you have your dienophile and the p orbital overlap, these two come over top of one another usually when we have this type of a reaction. All right, and so when I have the p orbitals, if you take a look here, 
in the S trans situation, all right, one of these can align, this one right here. However, the P orbital over here is not going to be able to have proper alignment as this attempts to basically slide in underneath or over top of the dienophile. That's going to ruin the P orbital alignment, and you that kink is going to put one of the P orbitals, in this case the one at the bottom, out of whack or out of alignment with the dienophile. So S trans is going to shut down any possibility of a Diels Alder occurring. So that's the main constraint with our diene. All right. Now, as far as how can you optimize this, part of it's going to depend on the product you want, right? So many times when people do reactions, they say, well, you know, it has this limitation, it has that limitation. And that's important because it may be that you're in a case where you're not interested in the specific product that, you know, meets all of those limitations. So you have to kind of pick and choose when it will work. So when can I optimize this to a greater degree? Well, the biggest key here is using rings will very often lock S cis into place. So if I take a look here, right, I have cyclopentadiene and in cyclopentadiene, I do not have that free rotation around this single bond like I saw in the open chain system, right? That's shut down there. So this is interesting because what this is going to do is it's going to lock the dieno, uh, the diene into place. So this is going to lock the S cis into place. And that's fantastic. So this would be a much more reactive diene in comparison to just the open chain one, because it will always constantly be in that S cis formation. Whereas when I have the free rotation, it's going to, you know, switch back and forth between the, the cis and the trans. So when I have the lock-in that is beneficial. Now you also have to be careful because you could have situations where let's say that I have a conjugated system like this. Okay, so I could have this and this right here. Now at that point this compound is locked into S trans. So this one could never undergo a Diels Alder reaction because I've now locked this conjugation into the S transformation. So certain cyclic systems will be able to lock in S cis and that can be to our benefit. Now the other thing you have to watch out for in terms of avoiding S trans is that you can have a diene like this and if you have large groups coming off of position one and four, so I'm going to represent that with an L, right? I've got a large group, I've got a large group. This right here is going to cause issues with sterics, right? So when we talk about sterics, we talk about interference of two large molecules with one another. It's specifically their electron, uh, you know, clouds that are coming into proximity with one another. They want to repel and get away from each other. So if you put large groups in position one or slash end position four, then it will absolutely optimize its free rotation in order to get out and away from the steric strain because now it can have an L over here and it can have the other large group over here if it optimizes the S trans. So again, some limitations as far as, you know, S trans versus S cis and what we're working with there. All right, so that's the diene. Now let's talk about the dienophile. So the job of the dienophile is to accept electrons from the diene. So in order to do that, we want to make sure that there's really sort of a need for electrons. And the way it's currently set up to just have a pi bond and nothing else. So in other words, to just have ethene is kind of lacking in terms of the desire or the draw for electrons. And so we want to improve this. And that's most commonly done by adding an electron withdrawing group. And when we add an electron withdrawing group here, that's going to create a partial positive on this carbon right here. And so when I have the diene, then the diene is going to be much more able to send its electrons and have them accepted by the dienophile, which is going to kick off this reaction. All right. So some students say, well, won't the reaction at the top go? Because if this is giving up the pi electrons here, it wants additional pi electrons. And the answer is that's true, and this reaction will go, but it's the assistance of the electron withdrawing group that's really going to drive this and make it go at an acceptable rate and give you better yields. So this is going to be very slow in comparison because you don't have the need 
this isn't particularly partially positive or partially negative in one case or the other, other than maybe your occasional van der Waals force where you have a separation of charge temporarily and then that, that moment is over, okay? Because this, by all uh, accounts, is a nonpolar molecule. We want that electron withdrawing group to create the need for electrons. That's what we're working with here. So a better example of a dienophile would be, for instance, if I put a carbonyl here. Maybe I have an aldehyde. Okay, maybe I have a cyano group, a nitrile group. Maybe I have a nitro group. All right. So an electron withdrawing group is ideal. Now, that being said, an electron donating group would be non-ideal. You want to avoid that. That's going to make the reaction go even slower than just the regular dienophile would. And some students can get confused with this, all right? So as far as what constitutes an electron donating group, some things are a little more obvious, like the R groups, okay? By induction, we know that we can get some sort of inductive donating activity from things like methyl groups. But students tend to trip up a lot when they have something, for instance, like NH2, right? Because they say, oh, well, the nitrogen is more electronegative than the carbon is. And that's true, right? So by induction, by induction, I would expect a pull of electrons this way. So what's wrong with putting the NH2 group on there? Well, the answer as far as what's wrong with the NH2 group is that this has a lone pair. And this lone pair can donate electrons through resonance directly into the dienophile, right? So I could get a resonance form here where the NH2 is really sort of enriching the dienophile as far as its electron content is concerned. So I could get a resonance structure like this. Now, the donation by resonance is going to, if it's making it more electron rich, a dienophile that's electron rich doesn't really have a need to accept additional electrons from any sort of diene on the other side. And so groups that have the lone pairs directly next to the pi bond here, for instance, OH, if you had an ether like OCH3, if you have an amine that has a lone pair, all of those are going to be examples of donating groups, even though inductively they would technically withdraw, all right? So you got to be aware of this and be careful in terms of what really is going to be a withdrawing group versus a donating group, because by induction, these would withdraw, but resonance is a more powerful driving force than induction is. And so when we get to that point, we say, well, the resonance kind of overrides that. And overall, the net effect is that we see an electron donating effect versus withdrawing effect. So just keep that in mind. So these over here, these would be bad as far as the reactivity for the dienophile. And these would be great examples. Uh, you're going to see a lot of carbonyls. Okay. And you're going to see a lot of, so, you know, I can put X over here. It might be a carboxylic acid, an ester, an aldehyde, a ketone. Those are all fantastic choices. And again, you'll see a lot of uh, cyano and nitro groups that can be thrown on here. You could also see an inductive withdrawer that does not donate by resonance. So you could technically see something like CF3. Okay, um, because the fluorines would inductively withdraw. And if it's the carbon that's directly attached to the dienophile, we wouldn't expect that carbon to have any lone pairs of electrons where it could start donating instead of withdrawing. So these would all be good examples as far as the reactivity. This is going to benefit the reactivity. All right. And so I think that's enough for this particular lecture. We now have an understanding of the diene, the dienophile, and how we optimize them. So remember, the diene, the conjugated diene, needs to be in the S cis conformation, and that's in order to have proper p orbital overlap. And then for the dienophile, we, we would prefer, we would I, basically ideally like for an electron withdrawing group to be present on that dienophile. And if that's the case and we match those up, we're most likely going to get a very successful Diels-Alder reaction. So hopefully everybody found this lecture useful. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe as it does help the channel and allows me to bring you content. And I'm trying to bring content on a regular basis now. Um, the subscribers are almost to a thousand, so that's fantastic. Um, I hope to start doing more activity, maybe do some online office hours or something like that as the channel grows. So I will see everybody for the next lecture. And as always, thank you so much for learning with us.